From the 21st to the 24th of July, 1976, a meeting of about 4,400 American legionnaires took place in Philadelphia. Within the next 10 days, 221 of these people developed an illness characterized by fever, cough, and an inflammation of the lungs, showing most serious forms with a relatively high death rate, especially among older people. In the end, 34 patients died of inflammation of the lungs or its complications. Since then, the illness was named Legionnaire's disease by the press. In the microbiological search for the germ, a rod-shaped microbe was finally found which had bacterial as well as viroid characteristics. It was called Legionella pneumophilia, with an average size of 3 by 0.5 micrometers. The microbe can be found everywhere, in rivers, lakes, ponds, puddles, in mud banks, and in the ground, as well as in groundwater, tap water, in showers, whirlpools, continuous flow water heaters, boilers, cooling towers, and sanitary facilities. Its existence in the ground and groundwater is disputed by some authors, and it is said to be non-existent in seawater. The infection becomes primarily airborne by aerosols containing germs, as well as by dust, aspiration, and drinking of contaminated water. Latrogenic infections have been proved as well. According to general knowledge, the germs block the phagocytes and can reproduce intracellularly, for example in microphages, amoeba, and other protozoa, which might give an explanation for its pathogenity and resistancy. After knowing the most important connections between germ and infection, the course of different appearances of the, this illness could be retrospectively proved as legionellosis. In spite of active research in the field of the legionella, there are many open questions. How can contaminated material be recognized quickly and securely? How does the microbe react under different conditions of moisture, temperature, pH value, and various other parameters? How can one best protect against the Legionnaire's disease? The problems of detection methods used so far lie in the microbe itself. It is too small to show its behavior under normal light optical microscopes, where it can only be seen as small lines or points. With electron microscopes, the germ can be seen large enough, but it is only possible to observe dead material. The serological clarification for proving that an infection happened can be used three to six weeks after infection. This method can therefore be used to confirm a diagnosis and course of an infected person, not however for initial symptoms. Neither contaminated water nor sanitary facilities can be detected in this way. Culture tests or hybridization tests for proving the presence of Legionella take at least six days in order to find a definite answer. By that time, however, the fate of the patient may already have been decided. A new microscope is now available with the name Ergonome 400. It is a light optical microscope, yet allows optical resolutions up to about 25,000 times magnification. One test object often used by the optical industry for measuring at the resolution capability of microscopes, is the diatome, the fine structure of which is excellently suitable to benchmark resolution. The diatome Amphiplora pellucida has a lamella width of 250 nanometers each, and the holes in each lamella measures 120 nanometers. A normal, top-quality optical microscope cannot resolve these structures, whereas the Ergonome 400 can show all these individual structures. This measuring grid for scanning electron microscopes was measured at an angle of 30 degrees. The upper edge of the grid has been focused with the lowest depth of field, and then the depth of field is continuously adjusted without moving the objective. As can be seen, the grid is shown sharply from top to bottom. The combination of variable depth of field and high resolution allows each layer of this brain section to be shown sharply without the upper or lower layers interfering with the image. 
These qualities enable 3D images to be made, as can be seen of this long-legged fly. The joints of its legs, the head antennas, the great compound eyes, its mouth parts, the anal region, its lateral segmental located pulmonary openings, and the structure of its wings in detail. We have used this technique to investigate and document the life cycle of Legionella. All experiments were made in a specially designed closed chamber. The volume of this chamber is 2 milliliters, with an internal depth of 2 mm. Due to its unique design, it is possible to heat the chamber and inject fluids into it even during the experiment. The life cycle of the Legionella pneumophilia is shown here in eight phases of its development. Phases 1 to 4 take place in the biofilm, whereas phases 5 to 8 occur outside the biofilm. First of all, the Legionella attach themselves onto the surface of the material and form a gelatine base at the deepest part. The biofilm to which they adhere is a Legionella colony. These germs of 0.3 micrometer in diameter appear to be the microbe's constant state in which they can exist and survive when their normal living conditions are not available. Under favorable conditions, the biofilm is populated in the range of 2 to 12 micrometer thickness by microbes of almost the same size with a trembling movement of medium speed. When the depth of the biofilm ranges between 12 and 20 micrometers, phase 2 shows a tendency for the Legionella colony to grow. The average size of each bacteria is between 0.6 by 0.3 micrometers, while the single cells remain close to one another and their moving intensity increases. In phase 3, with a biofilm of 20 to 30 micrometers, the constant number of Legionella proceed to grow noticeably in length, where sizes of up to 0.8 by 0.35 micrometers are now dominant, that clearly have a tendency to move upwards. When the biofilm has fully developed in phase 4, with a thickness of 30 to 45 micrometers, conical villi arise to enlarge the surface area, swinging elastically from side to side like a waving cornfield. The exact distance between two villi is 10 to 12 micrometers from center to center. The Legionella have now grown to a size of 1 by 0.35 micrometers in diameter, and there is a clear tendency to leave the biofilm and form up in rows especially in the upper part, connected to each other by a thin thread. There is no further development when the water temperature drops down to less than 15 degrees centigrade. At a temperature of more than 25 degrees centigrade, the Legionella start to detach themselves intensively from the biofilm, where further Legionella are pulled out behind them. Due to their increasing motility, the single cells separate from the biofilm emigrate into the surrounding fluid and are able to swim. When temperatures range from 15 to 20 degrees, chain-like detachments take place where several Legionella remain connected to each other. Thus threads are formed instead of single cells, which can have a length of up to 30 micrometers. The following phases of development trigger a special drift movement in the liquid medium, which is called radial lamella. That means, in some layers, the fluid moves in a centrifugal direction and changes to centripetal in other layers. There are only three places without any such currents. Immediately above the biofilm, in the middle of the chamber, and directly under the upper cover glass. The Legionella move primarily with the current, sporadically against it. Numerous experiments confirm the fact that this phenomenon is not influenced by temperature fluctuation, magnetic fields, rotation or vibration. The fifth phase of the Legionella's life cycle 
takes place in the level of 0.45 to 500 micrometers in the lower levels of the chamber, which is a section with an increasingly centrifugal current. The Legionella now has a diameter of about 1.35 by 0.35 micrometers. The microbes continue to show tittering movements, which have nothing to do with the Brownian movement, but are spontaneous movements. In phase 6 of the microbe's development, it has reached a size of about 1.5 by 0.35 micrometers in diameter. This phase takes place in the level between 500 and 1000 micrometers above the base of the chamber, where the centrifugal current slows down until it reaches standstill. The microbe now strives in a vertical direction in order to reach the next current layer. The seventh phase, at a level between 1000 and 1700 micrometers, is mainly characterized by a centripetal current, where the speed steadily reduces from a level of 1500 micrometers. About 60% of the Legionella still move with the current, while the rest use their own strong movements to swim against the current. The length can now be as much as 2 micrometers, where the diameter remains constant. In the eighth and final phase, between 1700 and 2000 micrometers, the centripetal current slows down until it reaches standstill. At a low population density, active movements in all directions can be observed. With increasing density, the microbes move into an increasingly slanting direction until they reach vertical at the upper cover glass of the chamber. It is here that the microbe has also reached its maximum size of 3 by 0.45 micrometers in diameter. It should be mentioned here that the growth of the Legionella from the biofilm happens in such a way that the germs form a wrapping in the shape of a hose which is found at the end of the outer cell membrane of matured Legionella. This wrapping can contain up to four of these germ cells as granulation nuclei. Generally, groups of microbes, morphologically, often show the same characteristic life cycle, which is why they often cannot be distinguished by their outward appearance. In 1924, Professor Enderlein proved the microbe Sclerothrix tuberculosis to have granulated, not granulated, and stretch shapes with central interlaces. His research is described in the book Bacteria Cyclogeny. This diagram shows the sizes of all popular groups of microbes, including the Legionella. The smallest shapes of 0.3 micrometers are classified as rickettsia, while the fully grown ones of 3 by 0.5 micrometers are classified as bacteria. Lab experiments showed pleomorphic behavior that was dependent on their living conditions. This means the microbe can be observed as small rods appearing in various shapes up to a thread-like form. After adding CAMP and latenzin, the latter substance forms a mycelium in whose protoplasm you can find the granulation nuclei, mentioned previously, without showing any real activity, while the greater Legionella have completely disappeared, probably destroyed by the mycelium. Occasionally, it is possible to find cell membranes of former Legionella in the mycelia that have not yet been dissolved. Legionella do not grow in a common nutrient solution. Their requirements as regards nutrients resemble that of the rickettsia. They can only breed in living tissue and similarly cause severe symptoms of illness. What is even more astonishing is the fact that they can exist on biologically neutral surfaces like glass, metal or plastic materials used for pipe systems, especially those of hot water systems where most infections originate. Such infections are caused mainly by aerosols, which is why infections tend to take place in shower rooms. In this example, a lab experiment can be observed where an aerosol has been put on a glass surface. The tiniest drops of living Legionella have a diameter of just 3 micrometers. 
Blue-green algae and Legionella can coexist side by side without additional organic substances, as this example of the blue-green algae Spirulina platensis clearly proves. The microalgae is not attacked by Legionella. Where Legionella are to be found, other algae and diatomes cease to exist, along with smaller protozoa like here in aquarium water. Bigger protozoa, however, survive the provocation, as can be seen here with Peronema trichophorum. Legionella are proteolytically active bacteria, which means that they require peptides and amino acids instead of carbohydrates for their metabolism. They grow best at a pH value of 6.9, which is slightly acidic than in an alkaline environment. Calcium, potassium and magnesium assist their growth along with iron and zinc, although in lower concentrations. Cadmium, lead, aluminium and copper inhibit the growth of Legionella at a concentration of more than 10 mg a litre, as well as a healthy flora in the mouth. The population can double at 30 degrees centigrade in a period of just four hours. In general, Legionella are shown to be aerobic organisms. However, their existence in stagnating water pipes proves they also have an anaerobic behaviour. Their staining characteristics are gram-negative, just like Rickettsia. Their endotoxin is a lipocholysaccharide, which is again a biochemical parallel to Rickettsia. Legionella are to be found in all man-made water installations, particularly in hot water systems, which is why the sensational media describe it as death under the shower, and the UNO catalogue describes it as a biological weapon. The microbe is capable of surviving in temperatures ranging from plus 60 degrees down to minus 70 degrees centigrade, and can even survive extended periods of frost. Here, you can see such a culture that was kept at a temperature of minus 8 degrees centigrade for 8 months, and then thawed. The microbes are initially attached to the biofilm, then become increasingly active until they finally detach to emigrate into the solution. In clinical therapy, erythromycin proves to be effective for the acute stadium. The in vitro test of erythromycin shows the formation of gelatine in reaction to the Legionella culture, where the big forms are instantly deactivated and die. Within six hours, there is a phase division with ensuing flaking out of the antibiotic, probably caused by a substance from the smaller Legionella forms. Afterwards, there is renewed growth and an increase in population. Thus, the initial effects in humane medicines might be explained, however, as well as the fact that erythroncine basically cannot solve the problem within a short time. The erythroncine test showed, after a four-week examination, that the entire culture in the chamber had died. The same test with Rifan Pekin had no effect at all on the microbe culture. Other test series with microbial drugs like utiline and latenzin also killed the entire culture after a longer exposure time of five weeks. It is obvious that infections, no matter how they occur, can only break out in a deficient immunity system. Here you can observe a healthy phagocyte that absorbs the Legionella and inhibits its activity in contrary to the weakened leukocytes. Now observe the tightly filled leukocyte in the upper middle part of the picture which releases its living contents by eruption. This is a blood sample from a cancer patient whose blood was infected with Legionella cultures in vitro.
After infection, the incubation period is between 2 and 10 days. The first symptoms are indisposition, headache, muscle ache, dry cough with little or no expectoration. Within a few hours, the temperature rises to between 39 and 41 degrees centigrade, combined with a shivering fit, aching thorax with breathing difficulty, aching abdomen, vomiting, diarrhea and confusion. Within four to six days, the situation degenerates until the patient finally dies of respiration failure or shock. If the person does survive, it takes an unusually long time to recover, leaving the patient with interstitial inflammations and fibrosis even after the clinical healing. Diagnostic signs are raunchy and relative bradycardia, increased blood sedimentation and deviation accompanied by lymphopenia and leukocytosis, as well as liver and kidney function disturbances. The following x-rays are from a physician couple of about 40 years of age, where they both contracted Legionella pneumonia at the same time. This x-ray shows the acute state that is characterized by translucence in the lower right lung. A week later, the state remains unchanged. After 14 days, the state improves slightly. After three weeks, the signs of remission can be seen more clearly. In the fourth week, the infected area has recovered, however, there are still partial consolidations. In this case, the acute state has also been documented, where a section in the lower area of the lung has been infected. After one week, there was a small recovery. After 14 days, there is no further improvement. After a further week, the infected areas have been reactivated. Pathologically, we are dealing with a fibrinous, purulent bronchopneumonia with numerous neutrophile granulocytes as well as macrophages in the alveoli. The legionellosis produced by legionella pneumophilia can appear in two forms, as Legionnaire's disease and as Pontiac fever. The table shows how these two forms differ and that the Pontiac fever is less severe. High risk factors for this disease are nicotine and alcohol abuse, lung disease and remaining in hospitals due to the higher probability of air contamination. Certainly, the cause of every infection depends upon the virulence of the germ and most of all on the effectiveness of the patient's immune system. Legionella pneumophilia seems to predominantly attack the respiratory tract and the nervous system. That is why older people, from about 40, are in greater danger of being infected. The microbiological detective work led to the discovery of a rod-shaped microbe that has both bacterial and viral properties. It has been called Legionella pneumophilia and its size has been stated to be 3 by 0.5 micrometers. The microbe can be found in rivers, seas, ponds, puddles, mud and in the soil as well as in the groundwater, tap water, in showers, whirlpools, water heaters, cooling towers and other sanitary facilities. The scientific results presented in this film were only possible through the use of the Ergonome 400 microscope, which allows a resolution of better than 200 nanometers and thus a reasonable enlargement of more than 25,000 times. The results shown are only partial findings and should give impulses to biological medical researchers and others to research these problems more thoroughly.